Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Comics Rot Your Brain, the show where professional screenwriters talk about comic books that we love mostly from the 1980s. I'm your host, Chris Derrick, and my esteemed host, Stephen Megatorian, will not be joining us today. He's off creating a magnificent screenplay that he'll get to talk to you about someday very soon. Now, before we get into the episode proper, don't forget to check out our Patreon, which is at patreon.com forward slash comics rot your brain. And don't forget to hit like, comment, and subscribe and turn on that notification bell. As you know, we do read our comments and we respond to almost every one. And this episode, I'll be covering Atari Force, the fan favorite science fiction comic series that came out in 1984. Just to let you know, um, how this actually worked. In 1982, DC Comics teamed up with Atari to create these five comic inserts that came with some of the Atari 2600 video games. If you happen to buy Defender, Berserk, Star Raiders, Phoenix, or Galaxian, you would get those five issues. But in 1984, DC Comics decided to relaunch the series with characters who were the children of the characters in the original five issue series. Now, Atari Force stands for Advanced Technology and Research Institute. And in the way that this works is that those original five series came out and they were set in the year 2005. And then this second ongoing series, which ran 20 issues, was set like 25 years later. So in the year 2030, essentially, what's just around the corner from us now. So just to set the record straight some more on this in terms of how all the characters work, because it's kind of interesting, but it's weird because almost no one could get their hands on those um, five issue inserts. And the original members were Lee San Rourke, Mohandas Singh, Dr. Lucas Orion, there was Lydia Perez, and their leader, Martin Champion. And they had this starship that was called Scanner One that would travel the multiverse, and they were tasked with finding a new homeworld for mankind. So now I didn't read those first five, I just read the, the first three issues of the ongoing series. And at that point, they had already found what they call a new earth and I believe that is where humanity has moved from because once again there was a problem with earth with mankind des destroying the the planet uh, which seems to be like a running theme in a lot of books in the late 70s and the early 80s is that man was creating these kind of like these natural disasters these e these ecological disasters I would rather say so that's how we kind of look at what's happening um, in terms of probably what's going on in the world. And as I always like to do, you know, what are some of the top selling works that came out, um, you know, in 1984 when this uh, book came out? So in Marvel, that's when Secret Wars came out. It came out in January, and which is the same month that the first issue of, of Atari Force came out. There was Amazing Spider Man 252, which is the first appearance of Spider Man's black costume which later became venom which i've said before is is one of my least favorite characters and then there was the x-men which was, were continuing their strong run um so now over at dc comics this was when they launched crisis on crisis on infinite earth and then like one of their most favorite books still something at the time was like was new team titans also in 1984 was the first appearance of teenage mutant uh, Ninja Turtles, the perennial Eastman and Laird title, that oversized uh, black and white book is what came out. Also, the Hernandez brothers considered their awesome Love and Rockets series. And this was the one of the years where the direct market like really began to take off. So, some of the top movies that came out in 1984 were Ghostbusters, Beverly Hills Cop, uh, there was Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. It was the year that 
It was also the year that The Killing Fields came out, A Passage to India, Terminator, and one of my favorite movies of all time, Amadeus, which later went on to sweep the Oscars. I think we also had like Nightmare on Elm Street and This is Spinal Tap. Um, so that's what was out like concurrently when Atari first came out. Now, the reason why I always try to bring up what was going on in pop culture at the same time as the comics we're reading is, I think it's important to kind of know the context, what was happening in the world, the, the popular arts, so that we can properly praise something. Because art typically doesn't exist in a vacuum. I mean, like great artists... Or or, or, or or even just commercial artists at the time, they're making work that really reflects what's going on in society, which sort of goes back to what I was saying a few seconds ago about how this pressure about about man destroying the environment, and, and that was going to lead to the destruction of the planet, which here we are, like, it's 40 years later, and that hasn't happened, but maybe it already has, because, because maybe climate change is already, like, just gone on too far. But I want to get back into talking about Atari Force. And so this new series, was, which I said takes place around the year of 2030, uh, there are, what, there's there's six or seven like like major characters that, that, that appear that I think are interesting. So there's Dart, there's Blackjack, there's Morphia, there's Professor Lucia Venture, there's Tempest, there's Packrat, and there's Babe, and they are going to be going on all these uh, type of adventures, as we will soon see. So to start off with issue one, which I re which I really love the cover on, because you see the whole team together. You also see in the background of the team, you see um, uh, you see Martin Champion, who is the father of Tempest. He was from the the original force but he's but but in the first three issues he appears but there is no like group yet which i think is kind of interesting and it was also cool in the first cover issue is there's this thick mask figure in the background he's kind of like hazy the way that he's drawn by um jose luis garcia lopez by the way this book was written by uh, jerry conway and, uh, and the original series was written by jerry conway and uh, Roy Thomas. Now, this book, um, which is really interesting, is that for the first three issues, they do something where they, where all the characters are introduced on their own, and they're having their own storylines. And for three issues, they're having just their own storylines uh, that don't intersect. The only thing that sort of has them connected to a degree is, you know, that we know that Dart is part of Atari. It's part of the Tari Institute, and but she's not there with them. She's out just being a mercenary with this guy named Blackjack. So the story opens up with Dart and Blackjack. They're in a big fight in like some sort of brothel or something like that, uh, th because they were supposed to work for this guy named General Key, but he's cheated them out of their money, and now they're trying to whoop his ass and get their money back, and it, it, it opens up with this, there's a there's an interesting page where someone's drunk, and they're hearing this fight go on, and then it jumps to this this dual page spread that, that, that we'll see uh, Garcia Lopez do several times to open up, like, each of the first three issues, and it's this really cool way to kind of, like, just to jam the action, like, deep, hard, and into your face, and we see Dart just kicking ass, and... Um, at the same time, you know, like we see Blackjack and they're fighting and it's just one of these like super cool panels that just tells you the tone and the skill set of these two heroes that we're going to be following. And they are, you know, like I said, like like they're just trying to like to get their money back from this guy who cheated them out of some, they probably did some like sabotage work for them. It's not super clearly dis describe what it is, but the thing that really like sets it off in this, you know, on page four is Dart has this vision and it's one of her superpowers because her mother, um, Singh, who, and her father, Mohandas, um, they were, no, I'm sorry, it's, it's O'Rourke and Mohandas, 
um, they were stuck in the multiverse, not stuck, but they traveled to it so many times that their that their DNA got changed, and the kids, which is also the same with, with champion Skid Christopher, who goes by the name of Tempest, they have these powers, and Dart's powers are she can see visions of the future that um, sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong, but in the book they're usually always right, but they're, they're only maybe like a few seconds ahead of what's happening. So there's there's sort of like Spider-Man's powers of like his spider sense, where he can just sense something's going on. Whereas Spider-Man, he just kind of senses it. He doesn't really know what it is. He just knows there's danger. But Dart, she actually sees something. And Garcia Lopez does this really cool thing where he draws, like, he draws these kind of greenish figures of of that's what the future looks like and dart like it's kind of like in her head she's like oh my god we have to get out of here because there's these uh these colony cops are coming and she's like we gotta escape and so they're pushing through this bar slash bottle and they you know they, they end up in uh like a back room and it's a dead end and dart has these little things on her little uh utility belt for lack of a better term and it's these small little grenades and she throws it against the wall and, and they're like we gotta get out of here because there's all these bullets coming at them and smashing and crash 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 and they just dive out the wall and what's so interesting about the way garcia like lopez the, the way that he does his art is that he really again like i mentioned this one time and when we when we did thriller or maybe yeah it was thriller about characters as or art sorry as when artists can draw people's facial expressions um you know, to communicate as much information as possible, which doesn't always happen that much in superhero comics because there's a lot of superhero comics that, you know, people, that their face is covered up with a mask. So, you know, so part of the the trick is that the mask sometimes has, like, the features of, like, the brow, the eyes are moving to help you, like, kind of understand the space. Like, you see that a lot of times with Batman and Spider-Man and sometimes with Iron Man, and it's sort of a, it's sort of a cheat, but I think that Garcia Lopez is really great at, at doing it just with people's faces, you know, and showing, like, the glee or the fear or the surprise or the shock. And he does this, like, great right when, you know, because Dart is pushed like blackjack like out the window but then she dives out and she's like oh my god what that was going on because they see their the the mountain or the bar they were at the brothel type thing it was, it was like it was on a cliffside and they've like blown out a back wall and they're falling to their deaths it looks like they might just be falling like maybe even a mile but before they do any of that like dart like she's not that far away from blackjack and she like she has like a little grappling thing that she throws you know to save them and it connects into the wall and they just just like oh my god you know we, we just have to hang here for i don't know how long so what happens next is uh, that guy named General Key, he has put on a disguise that's the cheapest guy, just like a hood, and he escapes from being arrested by all, um, with all the brothel people. The, the colony cops have got everybody. And then this guy, Key, he like, sneaks around and he goes into a, um, a tunnel it's underground and he meets the villain of the series, this man that we saw on the cover, and we don't really know who he is. And ironically... Not ironically, but smartly, the thing that Jerry Conway does is, is that he never tells us the name of this character. And this guy is super pissed at General Key because he was supposed to set this trap for Dart and he, and he didn't. And he failed to ha have them get killed or captured. And then he gets tossed into this river, which is just like, I guess, his acid because it just dissolves his body. And it's a really cool little, like sequence which you'll definitely see in the video on this um but you know but it's this great moment of like setting up the mystery set up the intrigue set up what's going on you know the thing that i like about this book which is interesting is that so many times we have mentioned that so many the comics from the 80s they're really dense there's a lot of language and talk and stuff like that and this book has got a fair degree of that but it's very um it's 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 written in a way by Conway that it just it reads quickly. So there's a lot of story being told in these 22 pages, but it's not overly dense and it's not um, too much. And it, you know, there's some people, but like maybe they're not being edited right. I don't really know. The editor on this book is is Andy Helfer, and this was the first book that he ever edited. He got up from being the special projects guy. Uh, 
you know, to, to being an editor after being at DC for about four years. So that's how, um, you know, we meet this guy and he's, and he sees this gemstone and he, that he peels out of the, the, the edge of the bank of the acid river. And he's like, Oh, there's a gem bobble. And he goes, beautiful. Is it not? But like all things that are beautiful is so fragile. And then he crushes it. And then, you, you know, and then he leaves. And then we flash to, the next storyline where there's these pirates this is this is like you know they're out and they're going to a planet called egg and it's interesting it's the one guy like he's just an alcoholic pirate and he's um and you see the planet in the background that's called egg and it's egg shaped and then they get there and they land and the and, and the inhabitants of egg they look like bowlers except for except for when they're babies when they're babies they look like these large kind of like fat i would say they're like they're kind of like a rhinoceros in build but they stand on two feet and but they have these baby faces and the pirate is here and he's here to steal one of these to kidnap one of these these people from egg i guess they're they're, they're called eggites as he calls them and this character we'll find out later on is going to be called Babe, and he like seduces it with some candy because there's, there's no candy that's on this planet. And you know, this is the interesting thing about the people on this is that the when you, when you become an adult, you just kind of sit down and you become like a rock, like a boulder. And so your so so your life is really. Ju- and I don't know if they wake up or anything like that because they're, they're not here that long. This guy, the the captain, he has got the creature, and then he just like sneaks it on board. And he, like, he kidnaps it. And it's kind of fucked up to a degree because it it reminds me of what happens with, like, slavery. And I'm always saying this because, like, at the time, I guess, you know, people know what this is. But I've just read this amazing book that is called Empire World where this guy kind of looks at how the British Empire affected the whole planet. And part of that is taking slavery from various places, uh, you know, and just like, like part of what the British Empire did is they exported slavery to all over the different colonies, to Mauritius, to the Caribbean, to the Americas, to, you know, China. It's just, you know, there's black slaves put everywhere. So in, in reading this, like I'm sort of being colored by what I'm looking at now. And, but I still think this is a, it's a it's a harsh thing to do to kidnap a child that you know that you're gonna put into slavery, and then he just takes off, and then we finally come to the Atari Force satellite, and this is uh this is our second to last intro story, and and this is like when we meet Tempest, and he's being observed by there's the empath named Doctor Morphia, and then there is the other professor. Um, Professor uh, Venture and and they have uh, Tempest go through this maze and again like Garcia Lopez he does this really awesome two page spread to show us how Tempest's powers work and he has like some ability to create these kind of like portals that go from the current the current the current world that we're in and they go into some sort of like multiverse and only he can travel through those portals when he makes them so if he was to bring an object or a person or a creature that person uh like would get destroyed the minute that it touched the the um the portal i mean the thing about like garcia lopez's art is it's a very interesting style to look at because this is art that is very muscular in his execution and it's so well i mean his command of anatomy is really awesome and I haven't really seen any kind of uh, like contortions of the human body that are beyond what maybe an actual human would do, which is different than what you see in some of the superhero stuff. But again, this is all pre the image of the image revolution, which sort of changed the way that that art was kind of done in terms of it got a lot more hyper stylized. And I feel that, you know, there's definitely a look to Garcia Lopez's work that you that you recognize as him. Uh, if, if you're kind of, you've seen his work, there's a great book that he did called Twilight, which I'm pretty sure that we're going to cover on this series. Uh, not this series, but, but on this podcast. And I, I don't know when, but hopefully sometime soon. 
Um, but yeah, so it's really cool to see, the, you know, like this, it's sort of like a danger room kind of thing, you know, and you, and you meet Professor Ventura and she like loves to smoke cigars, which is kind of a cool trait to give like a woman. Uh, and she's like this young, like, like very pretty woman. And we see that Dr. Morphia, she has just been assigned to, to work here at Atari. She has, she's an empath. She can like, you know, sort of like a psychic, sort of like that one character, um, no, not like that character. Never mind. Um, but 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 yeah, it's 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 a really cool thing to see to see what he's doing and to see how Garcia and plus the storytelling is so fluid. It's so like, like this guy really knows how to do page design and panel design, and his characters look so like awesome. Like their posing is such that cool Jack Kirby stuff. Like find the moment in the pose that's the most dynamic. Like he does this so well, and um. And there's no trouble in trying to read this. Like, your eye knows exactly where to go. And he, and, and even, like, page by page, panel by panel, you know, like within the panel, he's got your eye doing the right thing to make everything look awesome. And, I mean, and you know what's really cool? There's this page on, what page is this? this is page 16. There's this moment when Tempest is, is going to be killed by, the, by one of the robots that's in the maze. And he does this kind of structure where he does, like, six panels and it's kind of showing you like it's, these, it's like fast edits in a movie of like you know of showing Tempest. He's having trouble like concentrating to create the, the his his portal, but he kind of kind of gets it in and then puts his hand in and then he's he knows he's got it inside the creature to cause it to, to be destroyed, which is great. And then we see that Professor uh, Venture, she kind of holds him in a very. Uh, she gives him a big hug from behind and you kind of realize that oh he, she's like his surrogate mom because his real mother who is uh lydia perez in the first s series she's dead she died in childbirth and just that guy martin champion is still alive and he is upset at his son because he looks at his son as the the reason why his wife died and then coupled with the powers he's just like which now is like a reason that makes Martin feel like I should never have gone into the multiverse. I should never have done any of that. But that's how we saved the planet. So it's just like a sacrifice that he had to make. And but the sacrifice the son has to pay for, which is sort of like an interesting kind of um, piece of theme that goes on in these first three issues. And then you meet, you know, Tempest Christopher. He has his love interest, this woman named Melissa, who's the daughter of a senator, who's the world senator of uh, of the place called new earth they have a nice sort of relationship you know and and you see that that, that she's really good for him and and she's very attentive to his needs because he's uh, i guess he's maybe like 20 17 to 20 but he's very he's an adult with a super strong buff body but he kind of still feels like a teenager with his his emotions and the way he responds to things and he just like so uh, flies off the handle, high have cocked all the time, you know, it's, and it's obviously, um, his family situation, his dad was never there to raise him, and his mom is dead, but he's, I, I guess he's really good friends with a dart, and she, and we, we read about this, we never see it yet, that, you know, dart was also on the Atari satellite, and she had this ability to calm him down, to keep him emotionally stable, um, and then we cut to the next character, which is this character named Pack Rat, and he is a thief. And we catch him, and he, I mean, yeah, he's a thief. He's a, he's a daring thief. I don't know if he's a good thief because he's a, the reason why I say that is because he's able to get in to some really cool places, and he has, and, and he has some great plans. But uh, he's about to steal something. Well, he actually does steal something, but he, you know, he kind of breaks in and. And does this cool like he shimmies in and he's stealing this like it looks like a, it looks like some, I don't know some piece of some jewel some yeah it's it's, a, it's called the Clavian Crown Jewel which he's about to steal from I guess a vault or something like that but he's not slick enough to like not determine to defeat all the countermeasures and he calls the uh, the the guards they're coming after him 
and his escape route gets cut off. And then it's just, again, this great kind of like paneling and action. And the thing that Garcia Lopez does is really, really dope is that he breaks panels a lot. Like characters, like they move, they jump out of a panel where their feet are dangling in a panel, you know, to take you to the next panel. It's an interesting kind of technique to help you, to help kind of guide the eye to, you know, in case you might get confused although the re- it's not confusing at all it's so it's so expertly like laid out like that's what i kind of love about this comic the storytelling is so precise and so intricate because there's a lot going on and you have all these characters and, and there's all these different storylines that are happening that don't seem to connect at all so the art and the story has to be so crystal clear and so clean that you can that you watch these little vignettes and feel that okay this is building this is building this is building this is building and what's interesting is with pack rat is as we will see in in all in all the issues is that he is a scaredy cat and he's really good at escaping things but when he gets cornered he goes berserk and he just which is weird because it's like okay so you know you can't fight but he but he never wants to fight and i kind of think it's maybe an interesting choice where it's like he he probably loses his mind like he doesn't have any like his consciousness gets subsumed like when he fights there's a in issue three they say when he's fighting it's like it's this natural instinct from 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 like a you know like the the instinct from the evolutionary um it, you tap him back to that and then so i think he just kind of loses his, he goes in this berserker mode and he beats the shit out of these these guards and then he escapes and he's and he's got the he's got the crown jewel you know and, and he's like i gotta get off of this planet where do i go now i'm gonna go to new earth um, which is exactly where uh, the Atari Force, um, you know, uh, s- satellite is. And then we go back to Rock's world where Dart and Blackjack have, they've been waiting for like an hour, they've been hanging outside for, for two hours. And they're like, which I think is crazy because like your arm would have broken or whatever, just the, uh, who's who's that strong? But then it's just comics and maybe they found a way to hang on and but, but whatever. But they, so, so they come back into hole, and there's nobody there. So the cops have taken everyone from the brothel slash bar. Um, and they're like, you know, we, we got played because we didn't have any money. And we were supposed to do, and, I mean, what's, what's, what's up with us? And, but, but you get a sense of, like, B- B- Blackjack and Dart have this great, great relationship. Like, it's more than just, like, mercenaries. Like, you know, you find out that they're lovers, that they have this uh, sense, and they're, they're lovers and fighters together, which makes for, like, a pretty interesting combination. Um, and he, from what I can tell, doesn't have any uh, powers or accoutrements. He's just a regular human. Um, and then, so they're like, okay, so what do we do? We're, we're here, we're stuck, and we're lost. And then, you know he's like have a drink and they're gonna them and they're gonna wait it out here and they're gonna have sex obviously because that's what they do and then the last panel is we're back at the acid river and we see general key's skeleton floating on the river and it just says to be continued so this is an interesting way to end the first like episode or issue because you get a sense of who these characters are what their um you know but their worlds haven't collided yet and i think it's kind of cool that you're able to do this um but you know because that's it's, it's, it's always a tough thing to do to introduce people you've never met before or uh i've got no affiliation with at any level and then to have them introduced like so clearly as characters as what their mission is their not their mission but their goal like you know their character goal uh, it's so well so well executed so that what Conway did was he set up in a way that feels very much like uh, it feels very modern as well is what I will say like it's very quick it's very sharp it's so well drawn and the coloring and everything that you just like you you drop into the story and you're in and it's so well done and there's no way to be lost i mean you're you're not even confused you're just like mystery mystery okay and we know if you're good we know that you have as the writer as the audience you're looking at okay you set this up in a way that we're you know going to understand it and we're going to 
you know, I get it. Just like, you know, and, 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 and you've earned our trust as readers because of what you've done has been so fun and so novel and so well and clear that we're not confused about anything. You've given us just enough information that we're like, okay, cool, I'm in. So, so you bought me up to issue two, you know? So, uh, so now let's jump to, to issue two, which is called Dart versus the war beast it says that on the cover uh and you see dart and she's fighting this creature this, this ugly looking creature has this this weird mouth and hands it looks sort of like a um uh not a praying mantis but one of those but you know those plants like in in um it looks like a venus flytrap uh but converted into like a humanoid form and the actual episode is called direct encounter he says of the art very similar that he did in the first issue, where it's, there's one page where some action is going on, which is Dart and Blackjack, and they've joined the the military forces of of the people who are the enemy of General Key, because they because it's like they think General Key is probably still alive, and it's a single page, blah 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 action blah blah, and then the next page is again one of these double page spreads that's got the great you know like the title design, um and which is which is which is really cool the way it's done, and then you just see. It's, it's interesting art. It's a, it's, a, it's a panel design where it's a big panel that, 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 that goes across the top, and then there's four, and then there's five. And this is a panel design style that I, that I noticed that Rick Remender used so much when he did Black Science and when he did Low. Um, and I think he does it in, well, he does it a lot in those two books. I haven't read a lot of his work since those two books, but, but this is, but we're back with Dart and with Blackjack and they're, you know, and she, and you know, they're getting they're like these lovers on the battlefield and they're like, you have to go do this thing or we're going to die. We're getting pinned down for, you know, and then, and, and Blackjack is like, I'll handle it. Don't worry. I, you know, like I'll just get in and do this. And, you know, and he runs off and there's all this smoke and dust and Dart is like, is he dead? He he can't be dead. But and there's a big explosion, and then he emerges from the dust, and you know, and he's and he's not hurt at all. And he's like ah, he's like ah, I ducked. So did you miss me? And there's this great line where it's like she fights a smile, but he but he notices and grins. And then they're like, okay, so what do we do now? We have to get off this planet. We had to get back to New Earth. And then we cut back up into the sky, and we're on this. Uh, this thing called the sleeping dragon stirs and we're back with our villain and our villain is like dart is still alive i need her dead still don't know who he is still don't know why and he has this thing called the war beast which and, and which, which they say stinks like shit and it's a really cool kind of uh there's an origin to this creature which is kind of cool it says you know it's a race of genetically altered of warriors who were so deadly, so powerful, they laid waste to every living thing on their planet but themselves. And then when the, the villain is like, and then I found the war beast, he was the sole survivor of that race. And, and when I found him, he'd been reduced to cannibalism. So it was like he ate everyone on the planet. Like, that's crazy. And then somehow he has, the, the villain has control of this creature. And he says to the war, he says, I want you to bring me Dart dead or alive and then we cut back to um to new earth and we meet melissa she's walking through a garden and then this scorpion almost kills her but then tempest like he reaches out from his little portal and grabs the the, the scorpion and pulls into the portal and it gets destroyed and then she just rebuffs him like he slapped her mother and it's not that case, but, but he's like, what's going on? What did I do? What did I do? And then her father shows up and her father's a senator. And he's like, you swine, you got to get the hell out of here. You're such a freak. You're not the right person for my daughter. I can't have it. And you realize that she's just been poisoned by her dad. And she has the conflict of her own feelings versus some sense of like familial duty and everything like that, which is sort of a weird thing to have happened in the future. Uh, I mean, maybe it's still a thing in 1984 with the way parents and kids are, but I really don't think that it's that way now where a father could tell a daughter. But again, they might just be teenagers. It's hard to tell. Even if it was teenagers, they there's kids who rebel from against their parents. Maybe she's just like a goody tissues, but why is she with this guy who's like, 
well, I guess he's son of he's son of royalty. So there's that sense of like you know rich people are hang are attracted to other people who are who are at their status level. And then like he gets really upset because the senator tries to grab his shoulder and tries to tries to manhandle him, and then he pushes the senator away into some pool. And then he jumps through one of his portals, and he just hangs out. There's also some great dialogue that he's written. It says, for as long as he's been able to remember, he can travel between worlds, and he found a place to rest. He found a place where the real world won't hurt him too much. In many ways, like most of us, he's still a child. And it's an interesting point that he brings that up, because like we as readers don't think so much about who we are as adults or even when we're at the age of teenagers when we're reading this but we're so affected by what happens to us as kids as children you know they always talk about you gotta like soothe your inner child when you're an adult because you carry these core wounds from your early your first four or five six years of life that affect the way you behave through the rest of your life and it's a really poignant thing for him to write it that way i don't necessarily know if, if like if he knew so much about human psychology when he was writing this but it's a point but he knows he knows enough about it to say this and i think that's a really good uh point that, that conway is doing and then we are back to the atari satellite and we find dr morphia she's just like searching around and she actually has been tasked by the head of Atari to get information about Commander Martin Champion. She goes to his place and he's locked his, in his little outpost where he's a hermit. I guess he never shows up or sh I, I don't know how he eats, but maybe just bring him food. You know, she uses her, her, her abilities, her, her, not telepath, but she's an empath. She's like, oh, my touch, he resists it, but I sense tremendous anger and anguish and fear. And this is a man who denies my touch but he hears me and he comes. And then there's this great introduction of Martin Champion. It's a really cool little like, hero shot of him, which I'm gonna show you. And what's cool is, is that his uniform, the logo on the uniform is the logo, it's like the Atari logo. You know, it's like those three stripes that are, it's pretty cool. Um, again, just take a look at the art that's in the video and you'll see it uh, at a certain point. Um, but Martin Champion is drawn like a man possessed He's got a pipe, which is funny. These people are smoking like this when they know that tobacco is not good for you. I guess they don't like know it enough back at this point, but they know it. I mean, I was like in the 70s, and it was the Surgeon General was telling them that tobacco was going to kill you. But see, they're just cigars and pipes, not cigarettes. So maybe they just weren't. I, I know. I guess people were rationalizing what kind of tobacco that 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 that, that they could continue to consume. I personally like would be consuming no tobacco. Um, but there's a really great shot, hero shot, on page 11 of Martin Champion. It's like he's talking to Dr. Um, uh, Morphia. It's just this great close-up of him. It's so well rendered. It's such a great piece of illustration. Like, it feels like, it's, like, like he was like, oh, I got my art school chops. Just let me just really do this. Like, an il illustrative art school. That's it. Like, like his style is more illustrative than necessarily comic book stuff. But, but he's not really drawing typical comic book stuff. He's doing all this technology and futurism stuff. And, and, and to me, I might have said this before, but I'll say it again here, is that part of my way of judging comic artists is how they draw technology, how they draw all the, the like like the doodads and the cool stuff that the environment that you're in and and and, and uh, Garcia Lopez, you know he's got so much detail on the keyboards and the tech and all. See, it's all background stuff that you usually take a look at, but it but it sets the world and it designs the space that you're in and it conveys tone of the story. Because you draw it sort of cartoony or a little too like hoo hoo hoo, then you, it's just letting you know tonality what is going on like in the story. But but again, this is so well done and the page layouts are spectacular. I can't, I just can't, I I, I can't emphasize enough how dope it is. And then we're in this really cool moment where I've, I've never seen this done before, but it's like two spaceships that are both in hyperdrive. 
you know, faster than it's called translite in this, they get within a hundred, you know, a hundred a real space meters of each other, you know, because they're flying these similar routes. And they it says they pass like ghosts. Now that's a really cool image. It's a really cool concept. I don't think I've seen it in anything. Um pretty not a movie or anything like that. Cause you but it's really cool. Really, really cool. So hats off to Jerry Conway for creating this. And then we find again that we're with the slave traders. And there's the you know, there's a slave there's the captain and he's drunk off his ass and he's watching porn in his room and he's lying on a bed. And then his mate is like still he's awake flying and he hears the baby, he hears the eggite like screaming and crying as she's locked up in like the hold. And he's thinking, Man, I can't hear this, I can't deal with this, this is wrong. We took this child from the planet. What are we doing? What are we doing? He has a conscience. To a degree, I don't buy that he has a conscience. I just really don't buy it because you're with this man who's your captain, who's such a damn awful person. You would not be flying with him still because he's too awful. But I guess maybe he, I mean, he can't be that ignorant. So I'm not buying this whole part that he's now, now he feels like he's going to kill the egg. Out. He's going to just release them, the egg out. He's going to open up the cargo hold and, and let the egg out die. And right when he's about to do it, the captain like comes in and he goes, hey, he goes, hey, so you crazy? You know, and he goes, no, nah, what are you doing? You know, there's cargo in there. Don't do that. Don't do that. And he's like too drunk to even realize that his, his guy who goes, oh, cargo, I forgot. He's too drunk to even realize that um, his his mate was going to like actually like, you know, kill this creature to save it from a life of slavery. I think this is kind of interesting again because I mentioned before, it's like, you know, I don't know if anyone in the real slave trade uh, in America, like transatlantic slave trade, or the one in the Indi or the you know the Indian Ocean kind of thing, if they ever did anything like this, I'm sure they kill they kill people who are sick, but someone who's just like in great shape, no, that's just I like I don't buy it, and I I mean I'm not saying these guys are slavers, I'm saying this guy probably got tricked into being a slaver, um, but he's still with a he's still with a nasty man as his boss, and like I I got no respect for people who work with nasty people. Uh, and continue to work for them. You don't have to. You can find another job. You know, you can pick up shit. You can, like, that's that's a better job than, than working with someone so toxic. Um, and then we go to the other ship that was going by, and this is where we find Pack Rat. This is his way to um, back to New Earth. And he's kind of funny because it's like you, you come in in this galley and, like, the robots who are making the food are, like, upset because, like, some of the kitchen, some of the larder has been picked dry and the inventory's off and you see pack rat he's up in a grate and he's like ah it's me i stole this stuff so you know you know that i stole your food but he's like ah but i stole all this other stuff too and he's like i guess he's stolen a lot of stuff from a whole bunch of different people on the ship but then it makes me wonder how's he gonna get it off because he's a stowaway and then while he's there there's like a little creature i guess it's sort of like a like a ship a rodent uh and it chases him and it chases him and it's again he does this really great sequence, just the way he chose the chase scene. It's like this middle panel, and it's broken up into like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven images as he's being chased by this 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 creature. This looks like a lizard or something like that. But then the lizard makes the mistake of 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 quartering pack rat, and then his instincts take over, and he goes crazy, and he kills the lizard. We don't see it, but we know that's what happened because you says you know and this is the this he says the pack rat cornered is not a pretty sight and it's the last sight that the viper hound will ever see so you know that he like he killed it and then the next page is we're back with darts and blackjack and they're partying at night with the um with the rebel forces and they're just like trying you know and just trying to figure out like what's going on they're just and dart is talking with the captain but it's a great, like, it's a great, like, half page of what he's done here because it's this thing that, like, the movies can't do. Um, and, you know, obviously books can't do them either. Is that the way the layout is, you get a sense of, it's a single image that shows us the partying, shows us Blackjack having this thing. The way it draws your eye in, like, a, it's like a clockwise. Go from the top, swing around, swing around, come to the bottom, and the, you know, I, I, you know, and like blackjacks at like two o'clock on, on on the clock. You swing around, and and the cool thing is the way it's colored, 
the farther distance you are, like the more the colors are the same. They're blues. I mean, sorry, sorry they're purples and blacks and grays. And then we get closer to the next stage up at the middle ground where there's a fire, there are oranges and yellows. And then you get to the foreground, which is Dart and the Commander, they're like fully rendered in, in like the full color of color of their cup, cup, their, their, their color design, which is kind of cool. And they're just talking and, you know, and, 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 and Dart's not dancing. And she was like, ah, I'm gonna let, you know, I'm gonna let like Blackjack, you know, like dance with the rest of us. And, and then, but then the commander is like, well, he goes, but you seem sad. Why are you sad? And she says, well, I'm sad just a little bit. It's always this way for me after a battle. It's because my parents were pacifists. And the guy's like, I don't understand. And she's like, well, neither do I. He's like, my mom was a security forces officer for a Atari force. She taught me how to fight, but then she told me there's nothing worth fighting for. So she's got this kind of weird complex of where she likes to fight. She, she, she's a mercenary, but it's, it's, it's against her upbringing. And so there's probably always this sort of like internal struggle with her. Why? And then the guy's like, no, 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 no. This is the right fight that you did. You, you're absolutely right. You should have fought with us. And then she has a vision, which is cool. He goes, it's, again, it's the green. It's just the full green image. It's a, you know, the full types of green for the image, like the light green all the way to super dark green. And it's, it's the way it's all rendered. And it's over her eyes. And like her eye, her pupils have turned green. They're usually blue. And it's really dope because then it's the war beast. She's like, oh my God, oh, oh, oh my God, get, get I, I bend down, cover, get down, get down, get down, get down. And then like this woman that, this creature, this female creature that that Blackjack is dancing with gets her chest blown out. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and Dart is tackling Blackjack. And we, they turn on and shoot and it's the war beast. And he's huge. And they're like, don't get so close, don't get so close. And, and they, they try to fight him off. And he's just like whooping everyone's ass. Like he's so, like he's, he's, he's obviously, he's designed genetically to, to fight and to be a killer. As I said earlier, he, he's, he, he hit everyone on his planet. And he speaks in some weird language, but he's able to get out the word dart. And, and, and then they know that the creature's coming for dart. So they're all trying to fight, all trying to fight, all trying to fight. And then dart's like, wait, wait, don't do anything. Don't do anything. If the creature wants me, then I'm gonna, you know, I can't have anyone psych themselves with that for me. So then she's like, Blackjack, remember what we did on Rigel 4? He's like, uh, 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 no. And she like walks up very slowly, very carefully. And then the, the, and the war beast is like, now I'm gonna take you. And, and he grabs at her, but then she's like an acrobat in a way. She, she like grabs his wrist to, you know, to avoid being grabbed and she swings around and then you know she's like she vaults around and slips on now she's on his back of his neck with her feet and she's got him in some sort of like headlock with her legs and then she pulls off one of her grenades from her belt and like stuffs it down his throat and then she holds his 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 mouth shut as blackjack kicks him in the stomach and then he falls down and then he's like and then he swallows the grenade and then it's this cool page of like them diving out the way as the as the, as the war beast is like, rah, rah, I hate this thing, what am I gonna do now? And then he explodes and it's pretty fucking cool. Um, again, like fucking uh, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, his art is so clean, it's so beautiful. It's so, it's just like it's so pitch perfect for this story. Like this guy, I mean, he should have been doing so many science fiction books constantly and i don't know why he's even talking about it anymore because this art is so good i mean it's like a lot of art at the time of the 80s like it's you know it's it's you know it's just it's very it's clean it's not flashy but it doesn't need to be flashy because his command of anatomy and perspective and page layout ability and compositions per panel is like ideal it's great. He I, he knows when to use silhouettes. He knows when to not show background. He knows how to you know. I, I, I he knows when to show background. You know. Again, I said already. He makes super great technology. You know. And then like as soon as they you know ha have have beaten this creature, the last panel of the issue is Dart standing like. I don't know who's after me. But it, but in the clouds we see the the creature the, the villain the guy in the mask the 
the this guy you know it's not really there but it's like but but you know he's like Arr! he's watching you know and she's like i don't know who it is yet and then that's the end of issue two it's this great panel on her face looking up at the sky she knows someone's after her, but she doesn't quite know what it's about yet and then what they do now starting in issue two which is interesting is they do these things called fact files fact file one is on champion which is the father of Christopher Champion, his Martin Champion, and it tells you his, so this is his date of birth, 1974. He's age 53. <laughs> That's crazy. That's so crazy. Uh, it's just, oh, he's, he's Polish-American, it says. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, again, you know, it's interesting they do these fact files, right? They, they did this in, I mentioned, we mentioned this in Alien Legion. They obviously did a lot of this at this time, because uh, it sort of reminds me of like the Marvel Universe whole thing, that handbook, and also DC's Who's Who, and it's kind of weird that they would do this. It's sort of a it's sort of a, a cheat, and again in a way because it tells you everything. It's like a they're like encyclopedia entries, one page encyclopedia entries, but they tell you everything about the character, so you you understand some of the background more. So again, it's a good cheat because we don't have to like be told stuff about their background much in uh the story i mean we're gonna get exposition a lot because again there was this whole kind of technique that they would do in comics back in the day is you know the the mandate was every comic is somebody's first comic so they're always going to kind of repeat certain things constantly to, but not in a way that's bad but in a way to like go hey if you ever read this book before here like here's somebody here's somebody like bring you up to speed which is kind of cool this one's got martin champion the second one is uh and this is Pack Rat. Uh, the third one is Tempest, and uh, you know. And then the the there's and, and there's no letter column yet, which I always love letter columns because I love to kind of see what people are saying. But before this one came in, it's actually it's it's Jerry Conway. He's explaining the origin of the book, like how it started, like how back in May of 1981. You know, like he was asked by Dick Giugiano to go out to Sunnyvale, California, to meet the people at um, to meet the people at Atari, and they just went there. and And Gary was like, "I don't even know what the hell this is about." Uh, they, they were showing a missile command, and uh, and and it says missile command, and and otherwise, uh, which otherwise boggled our minds. And then we went home, and he was like, "What was this about?" It was he was there with Roy Thomas, and 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 Dick was like, "Just wait and see, just wait and see." And then, you know, the next year they dropped the, the Atari Force stuff that comes out, like the the the, mod, the Model 1, the books that I said earlier that came out in the, came out with the games. And then, you know, two years later, whatever, in, uh, yeah, two years later, um, they launched this, this comic book now. Um, it's interesting because it says that Garcia Lopez was hired to come do this. This was, this was his first work. This was his first ongoing work at DC. Um, and, and, and I don't know if it's his first, like, if it's, if it's first, I don't know if this is his first ongoing work ever, but it's his first ongoing work at DC. Um, and apparently he only does, he does issues one, two, and three, takes a break, and I guess he does like six through 12, and then other artists take over. And then Jerry Conway writes up, I guess, uh, up to issue 12, because the series just runs 20 issues. Um, and then issue 12 is uh, the esteemed Mike Barron takes over, our favorite guy from Nexus. So I'm at to come back and, and take a look at those, those Mike Barron issues because this is at the, probably the height of his writing ability. So I would love to see how he handles these characters just to give them a sense because he's does this kind of like, I don't want to say light, but this... I, it, well, yeah, it's sort of light, like like this. It's no, it's a devil may care attitude of what he does with space opera, which he does to a so pinnacle in Nexus, and there is a Nexus. Um, and, and and me and Steve did cover an issue, an episode of Nexus. So so go back through our playlist, or go back to our channel, and you can find that. Uh, so now let's jump ahead to issue three, which is the final one that I read, um, for this episode. And this one is uh, the this, this this one says Pack Rat goes wild. It's written on the cover. It's Pack Rat just like fighting off all these these colony cops. And you know I kind of love when they would put like the type these weird phrases um, that they would go on the cover. 
not necessarily the not necessarily the title of the issue, but something that kind of like you know I, I don't know it was like a tagline, and they just don't do that anymore. And here we are back with Garcia Lopez. Here's this great opening splash page of Dart waking up next to a fire screaming blackjack, and she's like all undressed and she's on this. Uh, I don't know, some fur type of like bedding on the ground and blackjacks in the background. Like, I guess he's smoking and drinking coffee. And then she's like, ah, she, and then he tries to calm her down and she flips him like over his, his shoulder and they, she flips him into the fire, you know, and he, he luckily lands on the other side of it. And then she's like, ah, oh, oh, it's you. You're not dead. You're not dead. You're not dead. And he's like, what is it one of your visions again? And she's, and he's like, yeah, she's like, yeah, I saw you die. And then it's like, oh, well, see, and that's actually the, the name of the, the the name of the episode is called "I Saw You Die." Now, just here we go with the it's on the it's on the page three, the panel, but it's right here with the um, uh, uh, title sheet, and it's, you know, it's something like that I didn't talk about before. But the the, the colorist is by the guy named Tom Azuko, who I've mentioned before when we did our episode on uh, Screamer. And he might have actually done coloring on um, Question 2. Um, the inker is by a guy named uh, Ricardo uh, Villagran. And I can't read the letter. It says, like, Bob Tappet. This, this is all, he does it in a script as opposed to, like... So he's kind of hiding his name. And again, the editor is, is Andy Helfer. Um... But you know, but here we go again, where Dart and Blackjack and Dart and Blackjack are trying to comfort her, and they are like, and and she and he's like, kid, I am not gonna let you, you know, like get hurt and get out of my sight. And they're by the fire, and it's all red, and, the, and he's kissing her and holding her, and you know they're about to have sex because she's not wearing anything at all. But what's cool is on this panel, which you'll see in the video, is. Her foot breaks the panel and it kind of leads into the next panel of this of this spaceship, the one that um, Packrat was on as as it docks at this, um, it docks at this uh, this thing called the some sort of docking port, and uh, all these people get off the ship and they're all like going in, you know says you know and, and there was and there's but there's guards out there watching see who's gonna get off the ship. And there's a guard that sort of looks like the same race as Pack Rat. But Pack Rat has, he's clever. He is disguised himself as a maintenance guy. And he is slipping through the cargo gangway. And he's, and he's moving all the cargo. And he's probably got all his booty in the, um, it, that's, that's in one of these cargo things. It's just, his birth name is uh, Tukla, Tukla Oli is his name. Profession uh but by profession and personality he's known as pack rat you know and then he's like really cool he like brings in the cargo he's like he's a thief and he's he's very successful very lucky until tonight and when he gets there he's like irk it's right in and and then the creature of the sp the colonial co cops is like greetings little brother long time no see and she's like and he's like tapping his foot it's a great little the way they did the panel design, it was so cool. Did you see that he's like, I've been waiting for your ass, motherfucker. I got you now. And and then we cut away and we cut back to Dart and Blackjack. They're buying a spaceship to get off planet to get back to New Earth and get back to the Atari station. And they get kind of robbed because there's no other spaceships. There's this guy, his name is his name is Unlying Leo. <laughs> Pre-owned spacecrafts. I'm like, motherfucker's name is Unlying. Like, damn. Um, but he like cheats them out of some money. You know, the spaceship. He's like, you know, you you know, you, you gotta deal with me. And then he pay, She flies off. You see the guy named Leo. He's been bought off by a minion of the the villain of the mask. This this guy named Karg, and. And he explains that, oh, I sold them a junker. He says, they won't get seven light years before that drive uh, blows out. But Dart and Blackjack don't know that, and they just take off. And and they're like, woohoo, we're on our way. And then we're back to New Earth, where Tempest is doing his danger room stuff in the in the maze again. And he's just testing his abilities, testing his abilities. And then he's in a maze, and he falls into a, a trap, and then he uses his... 
his uh, actually he's not using his abilities. He's just but he falls, he trips on a tripwire, falls into a hole, and he, and he doesn't want to get found up in the hole. So he goes through one of his portals, and it's like and Doctor and Doctor Venture's like, what are you doing? You're not supposed to use your stuff. And then he like blows a gasket. He's like, I'm tired of being your pet freak. Ah, ah. He just rocks off. She's like, she's like, hold on, man, hold on, hold on, hold on. You're not a freak. I would never, you know, like say that to you. Because again, it's like he, she's the surrogate mom. She tries to kind of calm him down and try to like, tell him what's going on. Tell him what's going on. What's what's going on? And he kind of explains how he's broken up with Melissa because the father, he's the world senator. You know, like he's he's messed up his brain again. Like I said, it's like he, although he's built like a like a like a you know like a big super like a Captain America type of superhero. His he doesn't seem to be more he doesn't seem, he doesn't seem to be more mature than like a fifteen or sixteen year old, and so I gotta figure maybe he's that old. I mean, it's only twenty five years between the first series and this one, and I, so he's but you know Martin Champion and, and Lydia Perez, I'm sure they didn't have a kid immediately, so he's 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 under twenty five, but I still think he's like seventeen or eight eighteen at the max. You know, just he just behaves like a he behaves like a like a he's drawn like an adult, but he's doesn't behave that way. And you see, she's up here smoking her cigar, which I still love. It's a great, just just it's a, it's a great touch. It's a really cool panel. Uh, it looks like it's on page eight or something like that, where they're this is full panel spread where they're walking through like a concourse, like a mall on the satellite, and it looks. Again, this like Garcia Lopez, like the amount of detail and, the, and his control of perspective is just awesome. Um, it's colored really cool. Is not, not not like before where like the the color palette like rolls everywhere, but it's so expertly drawn that he, that, that you know they don't need to kind of like trick what's in the background by, by by making that palette like just like one color with various tones and shades and then as you move closer and closer it gets more filled out the whole thing is fully colored because it's like he, the way he's drawn this is its skill set is there's nothing confusing you, know, you can which is a little bit in the bottom uh this like that but it's so well done like his art is amazing it's so fucking good i can't stress it um it's sad that this book has never been reprinted. Uh, I'm not sure why it hasn't been reprinted. I, it has to be because um, it's Atari. But it's weird because when I was looking on the I was looking on the Wikipedia page, they said that Atari was a, also a division of Warner Communications. So this is when when Warner when Warner I don't think Warner's was a public company at this time. Someone could correct me if I'm wrong. It was still it was still run by this guy named Stephen J. Ross. But I don't know if it was a public company, but he bought, they, I guess they owned Atari. Um, that, and that's how they're able to, like, to even do this. I don't think, I don't think this is a licensing thing. Um, it might be because they said later on in the Wikipedia page that Dynamite was going to be uh, doing some reprinting of those original five uh, issues of the vo volume one. The, the ones that came with the cartridges if you bought the game. Uh, but not these 20 issues. You know, like like not the Atari Force that most of us know and love, um, and this was back in twenty seventeen, and then and the, and they they were gonna do some new stories too with these characters, but that stuff never happened. So I don't really know what happened. Uh, it's pro probably behooves someone to write the dynamite. Actually, I'm, actually, I'm I'm gonna write dynamite myself and see what happened and see if there's some way to like do this. See if I can suggest a storyline and, and write something for them because I think that'd be great it, so but back back to the story like you know Tempest is he's he's tempestuous is why his name is that he just he, he tells Dr. Vent Venture ah get out of here I'm, I'm leaving he disappears and she's now is another great two panels with her to, I, but, see this is what they do I love they don't do this a lot and stuff anymore they almost never do thought balloons anymore I think thought balloons are like the, a lost art of cool shit in comics it's such a cool way to kind of give you someone's thinking without having them speak or without using those caption boxes because sometimes caption boxes are just like you know i don't know they're i, I don't know i love to see someone do thought balloons again i really would i wish someone had the balls to do this um and perhaps some people are doing it probably like now and then i don't really know but it's usually what happens is is that they use the caption boxes and the author is telling the reader what someone's thinking as opposed to like doing it in the voice of 
the character and and maybe they're like misreading a situation or you get a sense of thing here where she's like look I'm sort of tied because I'm this he's like I'm supposed to be his guardian I'm supposed to champion I'm like I'm a surrogate mother but I'm also like testing him so she's kind of in this quandary and it's just like ah and she's like where's that girl dark she would keep him controlled what else happened to her you know that's like and I, I don't know like Garcia Lopez is killing him with the way he's drawing her and, and all these these two panels like say so much he just does so much very like very slight and then we cut back to darts and blackjack and their ship has died and they're like they're near some supernova star uh they're 6.8 light years from rock's world uh they're in an emergency orbit around a binary star uh and it's just like oh they're trying to fix their trying to fix their thing and then dark gets another vision and this time the vision is a little different this time the vision has got a ship coming in and, and shooting their ship and killing their ship but then there's the shadow of the guy in the armor who's yet to be named and he's like so you kind of know like he's the mastermind of all this it's like she's getting more like each little vision like that has to deal with that the this villain is like doing to her she's getting more and more of a sense of who he is so maybe like in the next couple of issues like she might see this guy in the armor and, and or, or whatever it is you know and, the, and then they got to get in the ship real fast and 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 take off and and they zoom they've just fixed the ship just a little bit and they zoom away in the nick of time because the ship just warps in and fires guns exactly like you know exactly where they are so it's like it's it's like they had a sense of they were tracking them and they you know they're jumping on a warp and dropping a bomb and then they've moved at like a split second a split second before they they came out of warp which is really cool and they're like, what do we do? What do we do now? We're like, we're going too fast. And then the people on that ship are like, ah, they're going to play themselves. They're going to get stuck in that. They're going to get stuck in the gravity well of the binary star. And it's the, actually the guy in the mask. And he's like, ah, let them die. Now I don't have to worry about them. And then their ship gets stuck in the gravity well. And it's like, you know, what are they going to do now? They're like, we didn't know what to do. And you know, and Dart's like, we, we're trapped, we're trapped, we're gonna die here. And there's a look in her face, she's like, wait a minute, I envisioned this, we're, this is where we die. And then we cut back to the Atari uh, force, no, they're just at New Earth, they're at that docking station on New Earth, and that's when we're back with the the, the slavers, and they're bringing off the baby, the uh, the eggite, and it's just whooping her, and like, he's, he's, he's about to whoop her, because she's not aware of what she, her duties are supposed to be. See, this again, like, this is why I don't, I mean, it just, it kind of hits home here because I was just reading about how, like, these two whip slaves and beat slaves for not perform and, and consider them being lazy and shiftless and all stuff, for doing work that they, that's not part of their culture. It's, it's got nothing to do with their whole kind of way of living. And if they don't, and they're ex, they're asked to perform at a level of efficiency that these plantation owners like wanted them to do, but they didn't know how to do it, and so they would just get beat because to, you know as a way to teach everyone. And we you know that I mean it's just I don't know it's so brutal. It's such an interesting thing that I'm thinking about a lot now. You know the election and everything else just makes me think about what's going what what happened in our past in this country and in the globe with the treatment of other people who uh, who don't have the same technological advances and therefore they get victimized. Um, but right before the captain, the, this nasty man like beats Babe, uh, that's when Dr. Doctor Morphia, she grabs his arm and is like, oh, oh no man, what's going on here? And he's like, oh, this is my, this is my, uh, this is my you know, this is my property. Oh no, no, this is my, uh, I mean, this is my, you know, I'm his guardian. I'm just, he's been abandoned. Just just let me, you know, deal with this. And, and if you don't believe me, then, then ask my first mate. And the first mate does not want to lie. But Dr. Dr. Morpha does. He uses her powers to read the, the babe's mind and senses what happens and sees the story about how he got, you know, tricked by the captain, by Candy, and then it was brought on the ship and was basically kidnapped and kept into slavery. And Dr. Morpha, like, you know, hits him with the 
with with a, with an emotion blast in his brain and knocks him down and I, I pretty much knocks him out and, she, and she's like you're gonna just stay here you know I'm coming after you and then we cut to <clears throat> it's great transition of her boots walking away and we see the captain on his on his ass knocked out and we see the mate going oh what's gonna happen here the next quick panel is again we're at boots it's fucking great like this is a great that's a movie transition it's so good um it's like a match cut and then it's like oh his pack rat is being marched by his brother to probably jail or something like that and then he says ah oh, well you know what you can't hold me but 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 we get a sense of that the brother's like you've disgraced us you're a thief because you know our family is a, is soldiers and and uh and and military people and and police and he's like ah fuck your honor and shame what a joke and he's like man you've caught me but you can't but you can't hold me and he like kicks the guy behind him and he leaps off this this catwalk and they're like you're gonna drop man it's 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 800 meters and he like finds like a little uh zip line and zip lines across and the and the brother's like shoot to kill and just shooting at him, shooting at him, shooting at him. And the pack rat, he lands and he like goes through some little tunnel and he's running away. And, and he's like, pulls like some, uh, uh, there's like a, again, it's great art here in the way it's colored too, like to show in the shadows. And he's got these pickpockets and he to, to break his handcuffs. And then he breaks his handcuffs, his brother and the cops have found him. And he's like, uh oh, you know, I've got to run. And he's cornered. And his brother's like, no, 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 don't corner, don't corner. Because his brother knows he's going to go into this blind rage and he goes in this blind rage and it says he says you know his instincts are that of a pack rat they are the feral reactions of a prehistoric rodent and he just goes insane and in all these people he even beats up his brother and his brother's like man i should have hit him with nerve with narc gas not trying to try to capture him physically um and he runs off and he's like ah you know he's taking that shuttle to new earth but he's going to be on it and so will i and then we cut back to Dart and Blackjack, and they are stuck in the gravity well again. And their only way to get out of this is they have to like hook up their life support system to their uh, engines. And they're like, this is the way we got to commit suicide, because if this doesn't work, then what's going to happen is uh, we're going to burn out the, the, uh, the, the life support. And then they're like, okay, what do we do? And then he's like, you know, and then Dart says, well, so we might die. But at least we've tried. And he's like, uh-huh. And then there's a quick panel where he where he's like, Dart, I. And then she's like, Blackjack, I. And, and they're like, and they both say at the same time, uh, you first. And then they both go, damn, because they're just talking about each other. And they just like give each other a look. And then Dart starts to undress. And then Blackjack starts to undress. And then it says 30 minutes later, okay, let's do it. And they like, you know, and, and they go, if this doesn't work, then you, you know, I, then they go, boom, and then it blows out the circuitry. And they're like, damn, we're not going to do anything. And then Blackjack's like, okay, it's, it's my turn to go out there and fix it. And then she's like, funny, funny, funny. And he goes out there, he goes, oh, I see the problem. There's this kid, there's a frozen circuit. And then she says immediately, Blackjack, my dream, oh my God, this is where it happened. This is where you died. She doesn't say that, but it's like this is what this is what is what she means. And then all of a sudden, because he's done this work, the engine kicks on, or there's just, there's just like this electric feedback, and then he's left, you know, he's hanging on to the ship by his little um, what his space tether, but the ship just begins to blast off, you know, and he's actually he's not tethered. He's he's not tethered at all. He's let go, and she's like, no. No, no, and it just like, and she's just taken away, and he's like left in the void, left in the gravity thing, and then she says, "You old pirate, I loved you." She's crying, and you see him like getting smaller and smaller in the gravity well, and then it says, you know, next issue, the forty, that's the end of issue three, and then we jump to the fact files, and the fact files are for Dart and for Babe. And for Dr. Morphia. And, uh, you know, and then that's it. You know, oh, and then if we get our first bit of 
of you know it's the first it's the first it's the first now now wait the letter comms actually got letters. But what's interesting is is that the, the Andy Helfer's like this this is not just this is not just my first book as an ongoing editor because he's done some he did Star Raiders he did Power Wars he did some mini series and things like that and you know and, and he says but it's not just the first time that I've done an ongoing book it's the first time he ever got fan mail. It's kind of it's kind of a touching thing that he's saying that he's like oh my god. I worked on something. And he said, this is something that you don't get when you do one-shot stuff. Because it's usually, you know, you do it, and then by the time it's out, it's, you, by the time it's published, then you've already moved on. Because this is issue three, and we're finally getting fan mail. So if you do a three-issue, four-issue miniseries, or whatever it is, or, or one-shot, there's, there's no feedback. So um, it's kind of interesting that he's, he's confessing this. Um, and then there's someone who suggests that maybe they should collect this, you know, like the books, the, the, the first Atari 4 stuff, the volume one things, those books that came and put them in a trade paperback. I, you know, I don't even remember there being trade paperbacks at the time. This was like reprint stuff, but um, I don't remember. I just, it's 84? I mean, when did that Captain Marvel graphic novel came out? Because that was, I guess it's a square bound books, but I, it seems so, it's a weird suggestion. But anyway, these two pages of, 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 of letters, they're all very effusive. Um, I mean, honestly, you can't really critique this book. I mean, you can't, I mean in, in terms of, you can't give it like a negative critique if you know what you're going into. If you know you're going into like to a space opera, if you know you're going into something that is so awesome and so, uh, but it's based on these, you know, Atari. And which is like there's some weird like some weird some weird brand recognition going on. It's Atari, but there was never an Atari Force video game. It's not you know what I'm saying, and it's not based off of any of the games. It's just like this it's this whole creation from from Jerry Conway, and from um, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, and these guys just knock it out of the park. Like, these three issues are so strong. Such a great way to start a book. Like you really, really get a strong sense of these characters, what's happening. But you know what? But I guess it's it's ultimately disappointing though, because like I said, issues four and five are drawn by somebody else, uh, and then Lopez is back for a few runs, and then he's out completely. I think around issue fourteen, this guy named um um. Eduardo Barrett comes on and does some issues, and then I guess it's just fill-ins, fill-ins, fill-ins for the next six issues. Like the stuff that Michael, that Mike Barron's writing, it's never the same artist. I just feel like like something must have happened with Gar- with Garcia Lopez and maybe even Jerry Conway because they both quit the book they were creating, and or I don't know if they quit it, but they weren't on the book anymore. And it's like, and this is at a time when people would do long runs. People would do like one to two to three years on a book. And it seems like that, that these guys don't have enough. There's so much going on that they haven't even created enough story yet, uh, you know, to be gone in like a few issues, you know. Um, to, I mean, to be. I mean, this is enough. Like, if, like this is like you remember, when we did Alien Legion, like the storyline of that first Alien Legion, which ran like 30, 40 some pages that first issue, forty eight pages that first issue, which is essentially like the you know like two of these issues. And that like ran for so long. It was it was you know bi monthly and ran for years and it had such amazing art. I was, it could be maybe I'm not sure why Garcia Lopez left it. Maybe he like couldn't like do the grind of doing the monthly book. His art is so intricate and so well executed. I'm sure it fucking hurt him. I'm just, I mean it's hard to do that. Like his style doesn't lend itself to 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 long to a long run on a book. Um, you know, and I, you know, obviously he took two two issues off, and then he comes back. It was I hope he comes back. I don't know. Um, I don't remember because I, and I and I haven't gone back to look at uh, the other issues. I should go look at them and see. Just uh, just hold on a second. I'm gonna do that right now as I'm recording, so you guys can be see if Chris is lying to you or not. I don't think I am lying to you. I don't even know why I said no, no. Yeah, he's back with issue six. Oh yeah, and the cover is um, Tempest fighting. Our main villain. He's about to whoop his ass, but Tempest is reaching into his little portal, and he's about to grab him from behind. He's having to pull him into the portal. So anyway, but I mean, that's so that's Atari Force. It's the first three issues of Atari Force. It's a really awesome book. 
I really, really am so mad that DC doesn't publish this. I don't know why they don't publish this. I mean, it's not a reprint of this. And I don't know why they don't bring it back because it's not a licensing issue. It doesn't seem to be a licensing issue with Atari because Atari at the time was owned by Warner Communications. But I think they did go out. There was a bankruptcy thing. You know, the whole thing with Atari was such, such a sad um case of a tech of 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 a the of an early adopter tech company obviously because like atari 2600 was the first true home video game um but they couldn't it's like stay competitive and you know 50, 5600 was one thing or you know was it no 5200 is what it was and then there was another one and then they just were never able to capture that original magic once like as soon as like as soon as nintendo came they were pretty much done so, but so the the name Atari could be caught up in a, in some sort of um, uh, uh, I don't really know, like a lawsuit thing, but then again I don't think so because you know in Blade Runner this came out in eighty two so this is still when this when Atari was still around so which is that was a Warner Brothers at least released movie so they have rights to all the damn imagery and the thing and in the movie there's like they're they're playing there's an atari billboard now i bring that up because you also see the atari symbol you know the three stripes in the bill like in the uh, blade runner 2049 so somehow like waters has some control over some of the trademarks and stuff like that graphic design but i don't know why they don't have i i don't i would really want to research this and like I said, like Dynamite was gonna do it. They're gonna be really, so Dynamite, but Dynamite does a lot of like licensing stuff. So maybe they had some licensing stuff in going on, and then when they were digging deeper into the licensing, they got a cease and desist order. Who knows? Who fucking knows? Like no one knows, but the public. But I'm sure Dynamite does, and maybe those editors, or maybe they had just cut back. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I'm very curious. If somebody knows. You know, join the Patreon and let us know, or just drop it in the comments and let us know. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's it for this episode of Comics Watch Your Brain. You know, as a, if, if you stayed this long to hear me talk, which is probably a lot longer than, than what I expected I was going to be talking, don't forget to hit like, comment, and subscribe. Please join our Patreon, which is patreon.com uh, forward slash Comics Watch Your Brain. Um, just, you know, if you love this content, if, I mean, if you hated this version of just me talking or Steve's version because Steve did one recently on Batman and Superman the book the team up book called World's Finest uh, if, if, if you guys like us better together then let us know uh, but if not you know like we're definitely doing a lot more of us together I mean that's the whole purpose of this show we just wanted to get you more content out in a, you know this month as opposed to like maybe waiting a month between gigs you know and I mean between us dropping stuff you know, and for those of you who don't know, I'll just kind of like let you know. I mean, a lot of it uh, has been my fault. You know, when we first launched the channel in February, you know, we had been preparing it for over a year. And then we dropped it. And then we were just going to, our plan was to have stuff come out weekly or bi-weekly. But then I got on this Netflix TV show and been was writing on that from... Uh, March until the middle of October of 2024, depending on when you're listening to this. So, and during that time, it just was almost impossible to do do any recording. We were, I mean, we were lucky to get brought to light in Blue Devil. Um, but there's, but you know, but I'm off now, and, and and Hollywood is in a lot of trouble. So I don't know when my next job's going to be. Um, so we're just hopefully going to have like around five or six more episodes before the end of the year um all right that is the end of this uh steve usually has some really cool wrap-up remarks i don't have any more wrap-up remarks i've said everything i want to say as i'm talking about this um so again thank you for listening thank you for being a fan thank you for like like for loving 80s comics uh, don't forget to tell us what you think. Tell us what books you like. You know, this book I like, sort of came up uh, through comments. Um, it's something that I plan to do, but the comments were a few times. So I was like, I better do it. Um, so again, fans, just let us know what you want to hear. I, th I think we're going to be doing Zot soon. There's a lot of fans wanted to talk about that. Um, but but you know, but we're trying to just do stuff that, that we love. Um, I don't think we're going to do like, like like any big known books. We might do a run or two of something that's known. 
um, because, you know, so like this was no. But anyway, thank you very much, and I will see you in a couple weeks.